welcome uh, to this webinar with Energy Fin, one of Denmark's oldest co-owned energy companies and EA and digitalization specialist, Confident. Thanks for taking the time out of your busy day to tune in with us. My name's Natalie Pratt from Lean IX, and I'm joined by Jakob Vestergaard, IT manager, Energy Fin, and Brian Halkia, CEO and partner at Confident. We'll be explaining how enterprise architecture and data-driven EA tools improve the dialogue between the business and IT and accelerate transformation. Um, this is the order of the, the session today. So Brian's going to talk to us about complexity as a premise, and then we'll explain why EA is a cross-organizational effort how to operationalize EA with the right tools. And then finally, we'll hear from um, Jakob on how to get started with some practical examples from Energy Fin. So before I hand it over to them, just a bit of housekeeping. So you are all muted um, and your cameras are switched off. If you do have questions during the session, you can ask those in the Q&A um, field at the bottom of the screen, and we will get to them at the end. If I don't get to them, um, you'll see all of the questions and answers along with the recording um, in an email from me on Friday. But uh, right now I'm going to hand it over to Jakob and Brian and we'll be giving them 40 minutes before we open the Q&A. So over to you, Brian. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you for the opportunity to share our perspective on this topic. And being able so to do this in collaboration with Jakob from Engifun is a great pleasure. So thank you for that. And uh, before we start, I just want to stress that this is about getting started. So if you're in the early days of uh, establishing a company-wide and recognized EA practice, then hopefully this webinar will be of value to you. And for the rest, uh, hopefully you will also find some value in revisiting some of the areas covered here today. But um, yeah, let's get started. And I'll do so by breaking down the headline of this uh, webinar. So today, um, business success calls for continuous transformation to keep up. At least uh, this holds true for the vast majority of organizations. They don't operate in a static vacuum. Uh, instead, the dynamics are picking up in pace. Naturally, different organizations will experience this to a different degree, but nonetheless, the trend is absolutely there. And I think we all recognize that. And a well-managed enterprise architecture is a critical foundation for dealing with this. If your enterprise architecture is more or less the accidental sum of project architectures, then you will be weighing yourself down and become less and less nimble over time. And it seems like outside of digital, in a lot of areas, we're used to mature practices when it comes to a holistic planning ahead. And just one example of this, like in city planning, we can all relate to that, where you have development plans for different neighborhoods and work with different development scenarios. And you consider how you could say various scenarios would impose requirements on, for example, different kinds of infrastructure. So you know how to act depending on which scenario unfolds. Again, this is just one example out of many uh, that go along the same lines. But for some reason, at least in many organizations, this type of holistic thinking ahead seems less obvious when it comes to digital, even today. And potentially because of the notion that a lot of this has to do with software and therefore can easily be changed, we might feel less obliged to make an effort, you could say. And to drive a digital agenda uh, and a digital transformation agenda, you need to factor in different perspectives also uh, when it comes to digital. So business perspectives, there are multiple business perspectives across divisions and departments where you need to understand the nuances. And of course, there are multiple technical perspectives uh, as well. The important thing being that you balance these perspectives and don't just favor one, be it business or technical, uh, because that will skew your decision making. And to be able to do so, that of course requires dialogue, which requires transparency, but it also requires mutual respect, you could say, for what each perspective brings uh, to the table. Also, you cannot just have a few architects that think this thing about enterprise architecture is super important. More or less, every, everyone, at least at a leadership uh, level, 
needs to understand the importance at a high level, the why of enterprise architecture, whether or not they understand or care about the details. Otherwise you risk deviating off course uh, as soon as you experience some, uh, some friction. So let's shift uh, a bit to talk about complexity as a premise, uh, as we said, because if you're lucky enough uh, to do business in a context where there aren't much complexity, then probably you can, uh, you can manage uh, and, and do without an enterprise architecture the practice to, to support you. But I'd say for most of us, complexity seems to be all over the place. And it all starts, of course, with the business strategies and goals. We have established this much, and this is why we are here. We also know, and we have touched upon the fact that nothing is static. So external factors outside of your direct control, of course, will drive change. Just a few examples of this here, market possibilities, competitive moves, political regulations, new technology advancements, just, just to name a few, will uh, be a change driver. And then again, business goals and strategies, that sets the framework for your digital strategy and digital goals and how you break that down into projects. And the output of those projects will manifest itself into people, process, technology, and data introduced project by project. And kind of like I can say that keeping all of these things aligned at all times by itself, of course, is, uh, is a complex matter. And I think if we are honest, most of us would agree that projects are adding more to this pool of stuff than they're removing from it. And that inherently kind of like tells us that our complexity will be growing over time. And just to mention a few examples of that, like when organizational structures via divisions or business unit or might be geographical expansions, that may lead to things being done a little bit differently across your organization not always intentional and not always rational differences. And data starts to be used in, for new purposes without necessarily understanding the implications of doing so. Are they fit for that purpose? If not, then who must put in that extra effort to make sure that they are fit on an ongoing basis? And where should I even source my data? Uh, because it seems like I could get a hold of them from different places. Also your IT landscape grows and it becomes more and more difficult to assess the actual usage or you can say technical risk implications related to servers and software and services. And then finally business uh, people and technical people, they do not necessarily translate a business possibility or need or solution, if you will, into common language. So in that lies ambiguity and a risk of misunderstandings. And you say finally, a lot of what you have and this pool of stuff is also still reflecting old strategies and goals because, of course, you don't go back and recalibrate every detail. So I'm pretty sure there's nothing new here uh, to you folks. Uh, we all know this. We are all aware of these things. But it's just to paint the backdrop of the rest of the content we'll be going through. And it also speaks for itself that managing this is hard uh, to understand implications across people, process, technology, and data while still ensuring the alignment towards strategies and goals. And I think that's probably also why a lot of projects will often fail to take that holistic enterprise approach or maybe even fail to try. And we have probably all experienced that pain of discovering complications late in projects rather than upfront. And the output of that would be even more accidental architecture that will slow you down further. But let's uh, make a little shift to you, Jakob, to give us a glance of what kind of company in a Gefühl is and what complexity looks like for, for you guys. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll start out to tell you a little bit about uh, in a Gefühl. Uh, we are a multi utility company uh, based on the island of uh, Fyn. Uh, we are owned by our customers. Uh, we own and uh, operate uh, most of the electricity uh, distribution net uh, on the island of Fyn. Uh, we also own and operate our own uh, broadband uh, network uh, covering most of Fyn. Uh, uh, in regard of our commercial activities, uh, we are, among others, uh, buying and selling uh, electricity and uh, natural gas. Uh, 
we also provide um, uh, broadband internet uh, connection to our customers. We uh, establish and maintain street lights for several uh, municipalities, uh, and we also provide uh, services for other uh, utility companies uh, like billing or supporting their uh, customers directly. Um, in the slide, uh, you can see on your screen, uh, I've mentioned some of the complexities we are dealing with in, uh, in Igifu. Uh, I won't go into detail with all of them now, but uh, just uh, mention that uh, these are some of the reasons why we started to look at the enterprise architecture management and the implementation of uh, Lina X. I'll get back to, uh, to some of these uh, complexities in the uh, examples uh, later on, but uh, for now I will uh, hand over the presentation to Brian again. Thank you, Jakob. Then I'll uh, dive into this argument I made that this is a cross-organizational effort. And uh, this is Gartner's take on what enterprise architecture is. So the intent here is not to have you or I read this. Uh, you can easily look this up. Uh, I'm including it to stress a few important points. One thing being that, yes, this is about architecture, but in that word uh, lies a bit of a challenge because to many non-IT people, architecture translated into something IT deals with or something I'm not to be bothered with, and, and that's a challenge. So it's important to stress that when talking enterprise architecture, it's about that proactivity and holistic approach, and it does involve both business and IT leaders, as you say, equally so, because it's about those targeted business outcomes. So bottom line is that it's a joint effort. And, and if there's a perception in your organization that it's not, then you need to actively work on changing that perception, perception to get that full impact and, and value out of enterprise architecture. Okay, so just to establish some uh, common ground in understanding what the core components of enterprise architecture are, we can break this into three sub architectures or pillars, if you will. Starting from the right, we have the business architecture, the who, the what, and the how of the business. So who being the employees and the organizational structures we put around them and the what, uh, the, what the business should be or is capable of doing. And then the how, of course, are the processes that we have implemented and how we work. This is where the business people will have their home turf advantage. And only business can take responsibility for the right architecture here. Then moving to the left uh, in the middle of the screen here, it's the information architecture, information system architecture. This is how we then support the business via business applications and data and how we're moving that data around. And you can say now this is more into shared territory between business and IT, and which makes it a little bit more challenging to manage. And this is where we especially need to help the dialogue along. And then all the way to the left, we have the technology architecture. So what technology is required for all of this to work and function at all times? Software, hardware, and services to name the obvious ones. Uh, this is, of course, where IT has home field advantage. They have the knowledge required to take responsibility here. So each piece is critical to the next. So of course, if your technology architecture break, your information architecture will suffer from that, which may put part of your business to a halt. So while understanding each component, of course, is important, then understanding the relationships may be even more so important. I think we can uh, agree that when implementing change, we rarely touch upon just one of these components. So you collectively must be able to overview and navigate this landscape. No single person understands all these pieces and connections. And for most part, it's pretty intangible. You can go see and touch. Uh, so this is why we need a shared overview and language to kind of like facilitate the dialogue. For example, to be able to identify who to involve uh, and exploring different options in order to be able to discuss different what ifs and evaluate pros, cons, and trade offs of those. Part of this is also being able to identify which pieces we already have that can be put into new use 
rather than bringing in more stuff, uh, as it seems easier to the project. Back to that argument I made earlier, then that there is a cost associated to constantly building more stuff on top of what you already have. And if this information is not, you could say, easily accessible, there's a risk that uh, produce will move on based on, yeah, let's say, an unhealthy ratio uh, between assumptions and facts. And as we've discussed, that it leads down the wrong path and will slow you down uh, over time. Now, how can we then make this operational and efficient? How can we make it so that we can have a shared and meaningful discussion despite our differences in what's our home turf? And yes, this title includes a bit of a spoiler alert because part of that answer is via the right tooling. On this slide, don't worry too much about the font size. I'm not testing anyone's eyesight or anything. Uh, you're not supposed to be able to read it. Uh, the message here is just that not only do we need to understand uh, each component in the architecture and how they're interconnected. Maybe even more importantly, you need to be able to convey this information depending on the question at hand and the stakeholders involved. And make sure that each message is, you could say, aligned with the same truth about the underlying details so that the messages are not becoming out of sync and losing their integrity. So we need to be able to express the combination of knowledge we have in, in multiple different ways. This is just zooming in on a, on a few of the exams we had before, and I'll just cover a, a few of them. So the CTO must, of course, be able to understand current and emerging technology risks that you face, but also be able to communicate these in business terms. So where is it the business is at risk as a consequence of these technology risks that you know of? An example for solution architects, they must be able to analyze data flows uh, but for different reason, it might be from a privacy perspective. So where are we exchanging information about our employees? Another example would be finance. They will benefit from being able to look into the cost component, of course, but from different perspectives as well. It might be spreading out the cost over departments, or it might be by business capability. So that's just to name a few. So at this point, we've established an idea about what kind of transparency we would ideally like to have to support those important conversations. And it is definitely a tall order and perhaps hard to imagine how that would be doable by the conventional ways of maintaining output artifacts like diagrams and spreadsheets and slides and what else we spend our time on creating and updating. And this is now where you could say data-driven enterprise architecture management come in as the enabler. And Data-driven enterprise architecture management is an approach where you invest in collecting and maintaining data or facts, if you will, about your architecture. You collect this in a unified repository because different pieces may already be maintained in different places, but we need to be able to combine this data. And you then let the tool worry about making it tangible by generating the relevant types of output artifacts to support the different kinds of conversation you want to have. And this will help you involve your stakeholders and support you in different ways. First off, the basic thing about providing that visibility into your landscape from different perspectives, catering to different uh, stakeholders, but also it will make it much easier to work with that dimension of time and how things will change over time. Also, we give you that much needed common language that two pieces of this I'd say, one thing is the content. So for example, your business capability map, at a high level, that would be part of your language where you can discuss your business. But also being able to come back to those same visual artifacts again and again, instead of having to decode different visuals each time, depending on personal preferences of whoever is reaching out to you and trying to express a, a problem or a possibility. You'll also experience quicker decision making because of that insight into the dependencies. And also it's quicker to cover, you could say, multiple perspectives in the same conversation. Just a plain example of that, it might be the functional fit of an application you're looking into as experienced by the business users. So how does this look? Is it supporting our business uh, as it's supposed to do? But at the same time, looking at the function uh, or the technical fit, I'd say, as evaluated by IT, but 
because it also needs to be able to be operated effectively. So it is available at all times. So both are important perspectives to include in that same conversation to, to, understand, to understand each other's viewpoints. And finally, it's quicker to maintain data than output. And especially when that same data supports several different output artifacts being used. And via data, it's also easier to involve more people in collecting and maintaining these facts. And this again, then you could say improves uh, buy-in and trust in the artifacts. And I'm guessing this would all sound pretty obvious. Um, but you say data-driven enterprise architecture management tools are somewhat more recent uh, invention. So there's good reason why not everyone is taking advantage just yet. But I say in other areas where you have similar options to go uh, via data rather than visual output, you would never consider the alternative. So just going back for a second to that example I made earlier about city planning, where using graphical info, geographical information systems, for those of you who are familiar, where you have a geographical view into multiple layers of a complexity. Going back not too many years, those were individual drawings having a, a small view into the bigger uh, context. Today, that's data that's stored, but then being visualized as drawings. And therefore you can now stitch all these pieces together and also layer them on, on top of each other to get more perspective into that same view. And since it's data, you can even start to do calculations on these things that you couldn't do before. So it's actually pretty similar to that, but just for your enterprise architecture. An extra question to this, of course, is how to get started. And we'll dive into that now and see what that has looked like uh, at Energifumi also. Well, let's first look into a few high level uh, recommendations. First off, the, about how, and the first thing about how I would say is getting your why in place. So for this, Think holistic and long-term, so think big. I think that's very important. Alignment and expectation settings uh, is critical uh, in this uh, to see through in the long run, because oftentimes it will even require a culture change to really drive impact. And otherwise you'll just risk the decision to move forward with enterprise architecture management to hinge on the first step you propose to take uh, down that path. So instead you must start with the end in mind uh, while allowing yourself to take small steps. And also uh, we would recommend to take advantage of that tooling early on. Whatever information you have collected, uh, the tooling will put it out there to be used. And after all, that's where value is created. It's also putting it out there to be challenged. So you have a chance to build better quality in your information. There are always people out there who know has odd knowledge you could say about decision made in a distant past. And it's people you might not have thought of involving directly and asking. So since the tool puts it out there for everyone to comment on. I think this is a good way. It's a collaborative way and it's exactly how it should be. And, and don't think of it as someone uh, grading your work. You can't possibly know everything. Uh, and if you need to go door to door to collect, you'll spend way too much time on this. Of course, for this all to work, for the tooling to work in this, uh, it must be approachable and it must be intuitive to the different stakeholder groups that needs to use it, whether it's for contributing or it's for getting insights. So that's an important factor to look into when looking for tooling. And then governance that will get you off the right path from the beginning. One important thing being the roles and responsibility People need to understand how they each contribute and capture value from uh, an initiative like this. And also very importantly, everyone must understand that it is this joint effort uh, between IT and business. But also uh, on top of the roles and responsibilities, there's also basic conventions uh, about naming, for example. Um, but nonetheless, the recommendation would be not to overcomplicate things let it grow slowly as you extend your practice in this to ensure a healthy balance. So that's enough about the how, then the where to get started. So if you take just a moment to look at the bullet on the screen, you'll see that it's exactly the recommendation you weren't hoping for. The good old, it depends. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, I actually think it does depend. Um, 
So there might be a unique business opportunity that you are facing and you need to unfold that one and understand it better. That of course would be an obvious uh, place to start to kind of like unfold the context of that opportunity. It all, might also be on the challenge side. So it might be facing uh, business challenges. So look into where it hurts the most. Or my personal preference, I think, is to start where you can best make it actionable. So if you're hearing people saying, if only we had visibility into so-and-so, we would, and after that follows some kind of explanation of how we would act in a smarter and more efficient way, that of course is a, is a good place to start as well. But if you want to move past the it depends and just get that one uh, recommendation, I think the fallback recommendation would be to start with a business capability map high level and new applications and then mapping those two. Because in and of itself, it creates a lot of value to have that visibility into your application landscape in a business context. And it's a very strong foundation for just about anything else you can do as a next step. Finally, before leaving it over to Jakob, a little bit about scope. I say don't hesitate to adjust in width or depth uh, to make it manageable so that you can build momentum and you can learn and then scale it up from there. But of course, there is a dependence in there on the, in terms of where you are starting because not everything can be broken down that way. But the general uh, recommendation would be to start small and think big. So back to that original recommendation on this slide. But Jakob, let's uh, hear from you on how you have approached this at uh, in a given. Uh, yes, uh, I'll start out by telling you a little bit about our uh, uh, our digital strategy. Um, uh, we have chosen to focus on uh, three areas in uh, this strategy, and uh, one of them is our customer and the market. Uh, and uh, the other one is uh, uh, our assets and our asset management. And the third one is uh, kind of a support for the two others. Uh, this is here we keep our governance and it's also here we look into our uh, uh, in-house resources uh, in regard of uh, this uh, digitization process. And it is also here that uh, we mature our technologies like uh, automation services or reporting services or whatever it might be. Um, with this uh, strategy, we would like to, uh, to uh, push and support across organizational digital agenda. agenda uh, and uh, uh, we would also like to be better at uh, utilizing our uh, increasing amount of data from the different data sources. The first thing we started out with was to, to look at the organizational anchoring. Uh, and uh, at Inigifin, we have uh, decided that uh, we have a steering committee uh, uh, consisting of uh, our top managers in Inigifin. Uh, then uh, we have a number of uh, project managers uh, managing the different uh, digital uh, projects. Uh, and lately, we have formed a cross-functional working group that we call the digital group. Um, uh, in this group, the different uh, business area are represented, uh, and also uh, some people from the IT department. Uh, and as you can also see on the slide, uh, Confident is a part of this uh, group, mainly because of their uh, great knowledge uh, about enterprise art enterprise architecture, uh, but also to have an uh, unbiased uh, voice in the group uh, that can help us to, to keep the focus on this uh, holistic approach. Mm -hmm. uh, the next thing we, we looked into was the governance uh, and we decided that uh, our digitization should uh, be formed around uh, enterprise architecture management uh, as a practice. Uh, and uh, we have started out to uh, defining uh, some of the basic rules uh, uh, and also the roles and uh, the responsibilities in, in, uh, in these roles. And we have also looked uh, a bit into the naming convention in uh, Lean IX for the objects we create in Lean IX. But we have started all. Uh, we have started out. Uh, 
small, uh, and our plan is to uh, to evolve this uh, governance as we move along in the process. Uh, in this slide, uh, I've, I've also given an indication of uh, the timeline uh, that uh, we have used uh, for getting started with uh, Lean IX, uh, and uh, it says six. Uh, weeks, but uh, it's important as uh, to mention that, uh, and uh, Brian also told a bit about it. Uh, as soon as you start to put uh, data into Lean IX, you, you will almost instantly uh, get a val value out of it, and uh, it gives you some uh, some uh, good features that uh, you wouldn't normally have if you just uh, uh, documented your things in, uh, in uh, Word documents or whatever it might be. Yes, um, in the next couple of slides, I will, uh, I will try to dig into some of the examples. Um, as mentioned in, the, in the regard of the digital strategy, uh, uh, we want to be better at utilizing our data. And uh, uh, you could say one uh, precondition for this uh, is uh, that uh, we needed to be better at the, uh, all our data transparency uh, needed to be better in uh, in the QFU. So uh, what we did was that uh, we started out by hiring uh, Confident to log into our existing documentation, and they also interviewed our di uh, different uh, business department and uh, uh, thereby collecting facts about our application, our integration, and the, the data flowing between these. Uh, these uh, systems uh, and what we did was that we put all of these data into to lean ix and uh, uh, as soon as these data was in the system we already get a we got a, a quite good uh, overview of our system landscape and uh, uh, the relation and dependencies between our system um, uh, one, uh, I think, re really good feature in uh, in Lean IX is that uh, on top of these data, you can put uh, different perspectives. So, for example, if we, we wanted to, to to have a, a more data-driven uh, perspective, you, you can by uh, simple filtering uh, fill out uh, the, the the applications that are sharing uh, customer uh, information, for example. Uh, another perspective could be more technical, where you want to see uh, which of the application are sharing information via secure FTP or whatever it might be. Um, from this overview, uh, we started uh, to define a, a domain model for Inigifu, uh, and uh, we wanted this model to be a system agnostic, so uh, that we don't have to change the, the model each time we change the system. Um, uh, the next thing uh, we did was that uh, we started to, to, to define uh, some of the object, and we implemented them uh, on a new integration platform. Uh, uh, and uh, the way we do it is that we iteratively uh, release these new uh, data objects on the platform. Uh, uh, and uh, we somehow needed uh, to communicate this out to the business units. Uh, and uh, for that purpose, we used one of the standard reports in, uh, in Lean IX. Uh, uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, it's a data object roadmap. Uh, and with this roadmap, we could all of a sudden uh, give the business units information on uh, when we we were going to uh, to implement and release a new data object, uh, so they could uh, decide should I wait uh, for this uh, data object to become available on the platform, or should I perhaps proceed uh, with a more uh, old-fashioned uh, integration? Yes, uh, the next example is uh, that uh, today we have an, uh, an old ERP system, or at least uh, the version we are, we are running is uh, quite old. And uh, uh, it has a uh, end of life uh, in the near future. So, so we need to decide whether should we uh, update the existing uh, version or should we perhaps even uh, replace the, the, the system that we have. 
Uh, so what we did was that uh, we started out by uh, mapping uh, which uh, business capabilities this uh, system was supporting. Uh, and the next thing we did was uh, that we asked the ERP users uh, what their experience uh, functional fit was uh, uh, with this system. And uh, we took all of these data and uh, put them into LinaX. Uh, and as you can see on the picture, uh, this gave us a quite a good visual overview on uh, where uh, is the pain points in this system and, uh, and where is there a, a good uh, functional fit. And uh, we use this information in our internal communication, but also with uh, uh, our external uh, vendors. Uh, for example, our current vendor where we could uh, uh, start to focus on uh, on the, the specific pain points and also to to, to make sure that the, the things that were working well in the system wasn't uh, ruined or destroyed uh, if we made some changes. Um, we have also decided that uh, we would uh, use a similar approach uh, in, in similar cases uh, where we, we need to uh, update a system or even uh, change it or perhaps implement in a new system. Uh, because um, we can see that this gives us a good uh, overview and uh, uh, our hope is uh, of course over time that uh, we'll get a complete overview of all our uh, business capabilities and our application. And because of these uh, great features in, in LeanIX where, where you have uh, the possibilities to, to put uh, different uh, perspectives on on top. Uh, this was give this uh, will give us a, a good tool to to uh, you can say identify and prioritize new uh, digital uh, uh, projects. Uh, often it's uh, dictated by yeah by it could be a department, but now it gives gives us uh, possibilities to 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 put different perspectives. Also like uh, the risk or how uh, the technical fit or is or how the functional fit is. Uh, also, uh, when we have this uh, complete uh, overview, uh, it gives us the capability to, to look, in, look into if we have the same uh, business capabilities in, in uh, different business units. Uh, and uh, this also uh, make us capable of having an open discussion on whether should we use the same system uh, for the same capabilities or is it okay to, to have different, uh, different uh, system in a different uh, business department, uh, even though it's uh, the same capabilities. Uh, yes. The last thing I will uh, tell a little bit about is that uh, we have just uh, implemented the, the standard integration between uh, LeanIX and ServiceNow. And uh, the reason for that is that uh, in ServiceNow, we have our CMDB uh, with uh, all the information about our infrastructure and the, the, the compo components uh, in the infrastructure, uh, meaning the underlying software and also the hardware. And for, for a lot of these components, we also have uh, the life cycles uh, on, on these com components. And uh, uh, by, uh, by uh, connecting uh, these two systems, we have the possibility to transfer these information over to LeanIX. And all of a sudden, then we will get this uh, holistic uh, overview all the way from the operational efficiency and all the way up actually to our strategic roadmap. Um, yes. Right. Thank you very much to Brian and Jakob for giving us some tips on how to get started with um, enterprise architecture in the organization. Um, before we close, so we do have um, perfect timing. We've got five minutes now for Q&A and there are a few questions here. So um, let me just have a look and see, see which ones to ask. So um, bearing in mind, these questions will get answered in an email on Friday if we don't get to them. Um, but the first one um, to get the full potential it looks like a lot of data uh, so it will take a lot of effort to collect and subsequently maintain how do you 
get buy-in to invest this time? I can take a step on that. Um, I say it's partially answered in, in some of the content. Uh, what I have covered, I would say, is uh, this thing about comparing the, to the alternative of spending your time on producing the visual artifacts versus maintaining data. I think this requires less effort and provides more value and you can distribute the workload more easily. So, so that way you'll probably be able to cover more ground with the same amount of resources. But maybe an important point I didn't mention earlier is that, um, unfortunately, not many organizations do uh, very good bookkeeping on how much time is actually invested and then wasted by the current approach. Just some examples of that, like, for example, ad hoc one-off documentation and project initiation, which is then forgotten about and, or abandoned. That, of course, isn't free. Also, I think we've all tried scrambling for information that's not easily accessible, but in the heads of individual people. And that's, of course, not free either, right? So, and especially when that, when you say multiple projects are scrambling for the same piece of information again and again, and, or even neglecting to do so, and instead just moving forward based on assumptions and then getting those learnings late in the project and have to do rework, of course, that's also not free. So I think my argument would be that it's definitely a good business case, but rarely do you have the historic, we say numbers to present it in a spreadsheet type of business case. And where you, you asked about the buy-in, I would say that it does pose a challenge to the buy-in. Uh, the point from earlier about getting the why in place and ensuring buy-in uh, with top management and that this is this cross-functional effort. I'd say oftentimes top management has no knowledge about all these inefficiencies and all these wasted efforts. It's kind of like, you know, put under the rock of different projects. Mm. So they may be of the impression that everything is working smoothly. So in order to get that buy-in from senior sponsors, uh, we often find ourselves needing to first, you know, create some kind of honest transparency around this and, and build that willingness to put some dirty laundry on display, you could say. Um, maybe a final comment on this question is that you could also be picky about what data you collect and maintain. So you only collect and maintain data that you know exactly what you need them for. So you have a use case for them. And on, over time, of course, that may become a lot, but then you're also getting a lot in return. Uh, yeah. All right. Thank, thank you. Um, I think I'm going to pick a, a kind of short one now because we've only got a couple of minutes. So um, a couple of questions came in. Uh, how many applications, how many users, um, Jakob? Um, at the moment, I would say we have around uh, nearly 100 applications. Uh, and uh, uh, we are... You can say like like Brian Brian mentioned uh, we take takes some small uh, bits uh, so I don't have the exact number of uh, of users yet but uh, I would say around 10 15 users as soon as we we put a, an application uh, in the system um, we 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 kind of try to 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 uh, to uh, in in our organization, we have some uh, uh, you can say system owners, and and these are the ones that we we introduce to the system uh, as soon as we uh, we have put their application into the system. But uh, uh, many of our uh, system owners are the same uh, for different systems. So so, but I would say uh, around 10, 15 uh, users. Great. Great, thank you very much. So we've um, just got a minute left. So I think um, there are some other questions there that we will get to um, in an email. So I'll be following up with an email. I think for me, the key takeaways really were that EA function isn't a one person job um, and that it is really a cross organizational effort um, that helps to achieve the business goals and that data is easier to maintain than output. That was um, you know, a good takeaway that I had and that you can see that the, the output instantaneously if you're managing that data in a tool. So um, 
once again, yeah, you thank you for joining and you can expect an email from me on Friday, including today's recording, um, a copy of the presentation and uh, the answers to the questions that we didn't get to, well, and the ones we did, um, as well as bonus material to help you get started in a EA in your organization. Um, and in the meantime, I wish you um, a pleasant rest of the week and uh, we'll be in touch on Friday. Thank you again for joining. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.